1958. A bulldozer operator for Wallace named Gerald Crew had been seeing large human-like tracks about 20 miles after a new road had been put in, in Bluff Creek, California. The road was built with the intention of opening the country for logging. The 16-inch long, 8-inch wide tracks appeared to be made by the same individual who would walk through at night, even going around parked construction vehicles and machines. He was told by his fellow workers, some of whom were Hoopa Native Americans, that the maker of the tracks was a giant, hair-covered forest person. Taxidermist Bob Titmus advised Jerry Crew to use plaster of Paris to make a replica cast of the large print on site. Crew brought his cast to the local newspaper and showed it to the editor, Andrew Gonzoli. The story was published in the Humboldt Times on October 5, 1958. Gonzoli repeats the name that he hears in the construction crew, that the creature that made the track is called Bigfoot. After this, people begin to see for themselves what was making the tracks. Several people working on the construction site told the paper that they had sighted an upright hairy being crossing the mountain highways, only briefly seen through headlights. One worker had been asleep inside the tool shed on the road and was awakened by the movement of something outside. As he opened the door, he was face to face with one of the hair-covered giants. Out of trepidation, the man swiftly handed the giant a nearby bar of chocolate from the table. The giant took it and left, and the story cannot be corroborated as the man had quit his job and vacated the area. Logging operators claim it was very difficult to keep workers on the job. In 1963, four men from three different towns who worked on a highly logging operation separately recalled a mid-morning incident close to where the two crews had been working. The second crew was following them and inserting culverts. Around 10 a.m., the first crew heard a loud crashing noise where the culvert trailer was parked in between the two crews. At noon, they returned down the road, only to find the trailer of culverts upside down, which would have taken half a dozen men to tip the load enough so that the trailer could be released, according to them. There were other occasions where 48-inch culverts, which were so big they needed to be handled by machines, had been thrown downhill into the creek. It's implied they were thrown, as the lack of any damage to the underbrush and foliage indicated that the culverts were thrown entirely into the air. This is the first incident of the word Bigfoot being used, although the evidence does predate the 1958 creation of the term. The Native American tribe of the Lummi Nation has stories surrounding Tsemaquez, their own version of the wild men of the woods. The stories are similar to each other in the general description of the Tsemaquez. However, details differed among various family accounts concerning the creature's habits. According to Sergeant Ken Cooper, tribal police officer for the Lummi Native American Reservation, who has dealt with many sightings as well as had his own, the beings looked very different from his relative's description of the Sasquatch. Another pre-Bigfoot account is an excerpt taken from Daniel Boone, The Life and Legend of an American Pioneer by John Mac Farragher. Another tradition said that Boone visited Limestone about that time, staying with his cousin Jacob Boone, a prominent merchant in that town. Boone had supposedly come down river after visiting his son Jesse at Greenupsburg and was honored at the gala dinner that included all of the distinguished local citizenry. After the meal, one of the men asked Boone for a story, and he begins a tale but is interrupted by a man who claims that his story is impossible. With this remark, Boone shuts up and despite urgings that he continue, he refuses to speak further. Later that evening, when he is retired to the room that he shares with the son of the tavern keeper, the boy asks him about his silence. I dislike to be in a crowd, Boone explains, and would not have opened my lips had that man remained. Well, we are alone now, says the boy, as he presses the old man to tell a story. You shall have it, honey, says Boone, who has taken a fancy to him, and proceeds to tell of killing a ten-foot hairy giant called the Yahoo. The Yahoos were giant beasts in human shape from Boone's favorite book, Gulliver's Travels. It was a tall tale that Boone repeated to a number of people during his last year, one such as he would have told in a winter camp. A Terror in the Woods Great consternation caused by the deeds of a wild man. Unlucky lumbermen slain and their bodies mangled in a shocking manner. Posted by the San Francisco Call on November 27, 1895, which tells of a story from Bangor, Maine. A lumberman who returned today from the forest in the north of the state brings the most harrowing intelligence of the doings of a wild man in the lumber region of the West Branch. He states that a great consternation has been caused and a large number of lumbermen have left the camps and returned to their cities rather than face the monster. 
For over two months, quite a number of men have disappeared up from the camps, and when found, bore the semblance of having an encounter with some wild animal, their bodies in every instance having been terribly mangled and torn. A lumberman who returned to a camp, a little north of the city a week ago, startled by all the stating that while at work he had been attacked by this wild man, and it was only by the help of his axe that he had been able to defend himself from the murderous attacks. Since that time he has been seen by the crew several times, but on their approach he fled into the deep wood with the speed of a deer. He is described as being so nearly like an animal that it is almost impossible to detect him from one. He has a long shaggy beard and is covered with a huge skin coat. The general belief is that he is a sportsman who has become lost in the deep forests, and after wandering around for weeks, he has gone hopelessly crazy, and already there have been over half a dozen instances of a similar character in this state. The crews of the lumbering camps are out hunting for the man, and hope by shooting him in the leg to effect his capture. According to Professor Jeff Meldrum of Idaho State University, from his book Sasquatch Legend Meets Science, the various tribes across North America have attached their own names to the entity. These names number more than 60, but most generally make reference to a wild man of the woods. In the 1920s, Canadian journalist J.W. Burns coined the term Sasquatch as a common denominator for the myriad of native names. Sasquatch derives directly from the word sesquack. The original word in the dialect of the Stolo dialect of the Hakamelem language is used by the Coast Sasku Indians of the Fraze Valley and parts of Vancouver Island, British Columbia. So the main question everyone asks, if we have so many historical sightings, why haven't we found any bones? Well, first off, we have to look at the natural history of apes in general. In terms of the fossil record, the evidence of apes is scarce and fragmented at best. As an example, we only have four isolated teeth to show for the existence and lineage of chimpanzees, and that's not a lot to show for a species we know for a fact exists, let alone the current living populations. Today there is an estimated 170,000 to 300,000 chimpanzees left in Africa, with rapidly decreasing populations. The current population of western lowland gorillas in the wild is estimated to be over 100,000. Eastern lowland gorillas are estimated to have a population of under 5,000, and mountain gorillas are thought to have a population of roughly 880. This is unfortunately not common knowledge, but animals need to consume phosphorus. Calcium and phosphorus is essential for animals because it majorly aids in the skeletal system and is necessary for many biological processes including energy metabolism, protein synthesis, cell signaling, and the production of milk. Phosphate deficiencies can cause physiological side effects, especially pertaining to the reproductive system, as well as side effects of delayed growth and failure to regenerate new bone altogether. Most vegetation lacks these crucial phosphates, so the animals need to search for them through other means, which is where opportunistic osteophagy takes place, where an animal goes out of its way to find and consume bones. Animals that take part in osteophagy are as follows but not limited to bears, mice, porcupines, cattle, deer, and more frequently, birds and dogs. Acidic soil breaks down bones faster. One factor that causes soil to become more acidic over time is the amount of annual rainfall in an area. Watershed might account for the acidity we see in the west, since there's plenty of mountainous areas there for rain to roll into the lower areas that, while they may not receive as much rainfall, they end up getting the water from it anyways. Wet climates have a greater potential for acidic soils. In time, excessive rainfall leaches the soil profile's basic elements, calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium, that prevent oil acidity. Soils that develop from weathered granite are likely to be more acidic than those developed from shale or limestone. There's also more trees in those areas with the most acidity, and dead trees contribute to decaying matter amounts, which in turn actually help make the soil acidic. The most heavily forested areas aren't just good habitats for large reclusive mammals, but are prime for woodland agriculture, which directly facilitates the acidity of the soil itself. As my colleague Crash Course Cryptozoology stated while we were conversing about this, old cemeteries appear to be more frequent in at least the eastern states which use much more chemicals than they do now, which is quite possibly a contributor to the acidity of the soil. Sasquatch likely thrive in heavily wooded areas. A species that relies on being unseen for its survival is going to be in the areas where it can seclude itself efficiently. The woodland's existence is significantly aided by rainfall, and that rain, along with the woodlands themselves, make those areas acidic making the preservation of rare animal remains nearly impossible to find. Both the soil acidity and forest density maps parallel relatively seamlessly with the areas where Sasquatches are consistently sighted. The Sasquatches are sighted in areas where the forest is the densest in the country, which is good for chemical agriculture that causes acidity in the soil. This in turn erases most of the remains quicker than in less acidic environments of an already rare animal. The densest forests in the country are the most acidic areas in the country. 
In conclusion, what we very well could be looking at is the population distribution of an extremely rare primate species, which would no doubt be endangered if it were discovered, that are habitually sited in the most densely forested areas of the country, as well as in habitats with the most acidic soil in the country, which break down bones faster than anywhere else in the country. Not to mention all the animals that quite literally go out of their way to scavenge and eat the bones from the remains of other animals. So it's not really surprising nobody has found any bones or remains of these animals. I mean, I'm really just trying to help this channel grow. So it would be really helpful uh, if you enjoyed it, leave a like, um, share it with your friends, share it on any Facebook groups you might have that um, might find this video interesting. Um, same goes for all my other videos. If you enjoyed this, it'd be really helpful if you could um, subscribe. Um, I'll be making more stuff soon, I promise. I'm just really trying to um, focus on school right now. I'm just wrapping up my second year of college. Uh, speaking of Facebook groups though, myself and Crash Course Cryptozoology have almost for a year had a Facebook group called the Association of Cryptozoological Fieldwork and Analysis. Um, I'll leave the link below if you'd like to join because um, we're always accepting new members. Um, it's essentially just a place for people to share their sightings, um, any interesting cryptozoological posts, um, and I'll have updates with my videos and stuff like that. So it's really helpful. Um, and we're planning on um, having group specific um, merchandise and events and stuff like that. That's only available to you if you join the association. Before the end of this year, we will actually be publishing our first book that I did. Um, I'm a co-author and did 100% of the illustrations for it, and it's called Crypt Hopes Zoology, an archive of famous frauds. And we've been working on it since the end of uh, 2018. Hopefully we'll have it out before um, this year ends definitely at the next conference. And again, if you want updates, so just follow the Facebook group. We'll be, we have um, updates on the books, the, the conference, the association, everything like that. Um, so it'd be really great if you could help us out with that. Hopefully uh, you can help us out and share this information with everybody. Thank you.